Roy, I'm a boob. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. A dear friend of mine. Thank you for joining us. I got to give you a proper introduction. Roya is time one of time most influential people in 2013, one of the first Afghani tech women CEOs, renowned founder and historical educator with one of the most impressive inspiring stories I've personally ever heard. And we have the pleasure of sitting down with you here today. And we really, really, really appreciate your time and your inspiration. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here and talking with you and you. Love it, love it. We met a few years ago uh, through the Human Rights Foundation and uh, we're friends now and I'm proud of that. And uh, I'm stoked for this conversation. How you doing, Dylan? Good, that a boy. good, good. That a boy, that a boy. Uh, okay, to kick off this conversation, Knowing you and knowing your story, I think setting the context, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, USA. So I'm from America, and within America, I'm from one of the biggest cities in America. I think it's the third biggest city in America. We're behind New York and Los Angeles, I think. And so growing up, uh, it wasn't until I got to meet folks like you, meet uh, organizations like the Human Rights Foundation, that I understood that I think close to half of the world lives under an authoritarian regime or does not have fundamental human rights like freedom of speech, property rights, things that myself growing up I thought was a given in being born. Uh, and then billions of people don't even have a bank account. And then on top of that, there are billions of people that theoretically could get a bank account but can't practically actually operate one or have access to open one. And that blew my mind in getting to know your story from Afghanistan, some of our mutual friends in Western Africa, all over the world and understanding Venezuela and understanding that w I grew up in a very privileged part of the world and I was aware that the world wasn't perfect, but I wasn't aware that half the world wasn't perfect, that one of every two human beings on this planet lives what I consider to be un unfair. And so it'd be awesome for you to start from the beginning and tell your story and how you got to what is the introduction, where you are today. Sure. I mean, for those who are growing up with freedom and uh, opportunity, um, oppression is some, seems far away. When education available for everyone, it's uh, difficult to imagine that uh, in some part of the world, uh, the authoritarian regime and uh, maybe their governments, it's uh, taking the education from the citizens. But I grew up in that society. I grew up in a, in a society that restricted the women's ability to go out, uh, to have access to the education, justice, and even uh, the financial freedom. Uh, our lives was controlling mostly by men. And uh, it wasn't until I was it was I was teenagers. I hear that there was a in a cafe that was open up in Herat. It was during the time that uh, um, the first time the Taliban left, and then um, and the U.S. and the U.S. ally was in Afghanistan. They provide a lot of opportunities, and they're trying to uh, provide access to opportunities, education, and women empowerment. But at that time, I hear that still uh, the reason a cafe, there is a magic box that connect you with the outside world and you can find any information that you're looking for. You know, imagine that you're living in a dark society that you don't, I, I shouldn't say the dark society, but it's just living in a, in a place that you don't have access to outside world. There is only one reality that your families will tell you or the radio you hear it or the mullahs or the teachers. Only one reality. You don't know that what's going on in the world. And there is only one library with old books that you can have the only access to those information. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hear this magic box connect you with the outside world and uh, you can talk with people and you are not be discriminated because of your gender or where do you live. And uh, I really wanted to go there and see this uh, magic box that people called computer. And that's I think that's uh, the for me, uh, my life is changed when I uh, saw the computer and I 
I couldn't see, but I couldn't imagine that uh, what uh, this technology can bring for me. And I made it mind to make technology to be center of my career. Obviously, I was very lucky because I had a father who was educated and who knows the importance of education for women. And he allowed me to continue my education. I went to university, graduated from computer science. And later on, I start my business. Um, you know, uh, I started comp- uh, like a, a technology company to hire a lot of women as a programmers and as a bloggers because I wanted to show to the world and also to the, our community what a woman can do if you give them, them the opportunities. And being a tech female CEO is anywhere in a part of the world will introduce you some as obstacles, but Afghanistan it was uh, different. Mm-hmm. And obviously those obstacles and challenges uh, actually made me who I am today. And But to overcoming of those, the, my journey to overcoming of those challenges, I realized that social media give women uh, in conservative countries a digital voice. Digi- mm. Digitalization can uh, uh, help women to change their lives and then they can live beyond the border of a country that they always known. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I know it that there are millions of the girls who were like me, curious, but giving a narrow vision to explore the world. And that's why I was uh, focusing to building a digital citizen fund, my nonprofit organization, that uh, giving access to, uh, to, to, to be the goal to see that technology is an accessible option for everyone, but especially for women in conservative countries like Afghanistan. Um, and I wanted to see that um, everyone have access uh, to these uh, digital um, tools and, uh, and education. You know, uh, I believe that the uh, physical border of uh, a country cannot limit it, uh, potential of a woman who have access to digital and have education. So that's uh, the reason that we saw the Digital Sum Fund. Incredible. And so uh, that incredible story. Why tell if you wouldn't mind educating all of us on why Afghanistan being a woman CEO is different. You had mentioned that very like slightly, but I don't know if our audience is going to be aware of why that's the case. Of course, a CEO is a CEO and gender doesn't matter, but in Afghanistan, gender did matter, does matter. Can you talk to us about about that? Sure. I mean, um, when we becoming, uh, I became as a female tech CEO was uh, difficult because having access to the finance was not option for me. And uh, we had to have either our own money or our family monies to, to get because the bank wouldn't give they're making a lot of difficulties to, to give a loan to the women and obviously that we didn't have much venture capitalists like here or private equity that you can get the money but it was different um, in Afghanistan but beside of that um, uh, being as a female engineer wasn't uh, something that the male accepted it was very male dominated and uh, usually when you wanted to get a cl- uh, client and getting funding in a project they always want perfect to give you less amount of the money than the your competitors or uh, the people who work in the same industries uh, sometimes they don't feel that they have to pay you and uh, they don't take you serious and then obviously you have uh, technical problems and then uh, like to working with technical engineers, especially if they are men, it's make it very difficult because mm-hmm. they don't like that the women be their boss. And traveling around the cities and also going outside of the city for a woman was very difficult. I mean, it's not like easy like a man that he can do it this. And uh, beside of this is a traditional and uh, social norms. And obviously you're living in a society that if you work with a foreigner and you give a contract, like for example, with NATO or Americans, uh, it's make it uh, easy for uh, people who start to judge you why you get the projects mm-hmm. because you're a woman. And they, it's very easy to damage your reputation in a society. And and it's make it difficult. Uh, you get threats, you get a warning, and they spy you, and they uh, they make it uh, difficult, the lives for you and for your female staff. And that's uh, I think that's, uh, that's also the reason I become a digital entrepreneur. I decided to not rely on the border of a country that some people can make a decision for you that how you run your business and how you have to live. And that's also the reason that I found the investors that who based in New York and he has never, he wasn't at the time in Middle East, but he decided to invest in our company and um, and things was changed and I, uh, and I digitalization helped me to change my personal professional life and that was the reason that I wanted to give the other women the same things that mm-hmm. they shouldn't uh, they should have the tools and make the decision for their lives yeah because gender discrimination uh, in Afghanistan I believe 
was the worst in the world by large margin, specifically against women. Yes. And you'd mentioned you grew up in that and then becoming an engineer within that and then becoming a CEO within that and then having the success you've had is like one of the most impressive. But what was it like growing up? Because you mentioned gender discrimination and then I don't know if you'd categorize this as not having access to free speech, but you didn't have the information that you were privy to was gate kept and there was a particular narrative that you were in hindsight pretty much asked to believe. So when when were you born and what year was this and what was it like growing up with that level of discrimination against women and the lack of information that you had to understand if this is how the world worked or if this is how everyone was treated? I was, uh, I, you know, I was grew up um, in, a, in a society in between Afghanistan and Iran because I, uh, when I was like, uh, in 1996, we had to leave Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan because Taliban took over our cities. And during that time, situation was very bad for women. Women are not allowed to go to the schools. They are not allowed to go to work. They couldn't uh, leave their houses uh, without the male guardians. Basically, women didn't look as uh, equal citizens. They look at the women. And this is 1996? It's 1996. So this is like in the beginnings of the dot-com boom in America. Yes women couldn't go to school, didn't have access to a bank account, didn't have access to transportation. That's crazy. Yes. And then uh, we, we couldn't live there because my father wants to think that education is a key for our future. So he, he decided to take us to Iran and we went to Iran. But, you know, Iranian, um, I had access to education. Mm. Uh, I could go to the schools, but there are lots of other problems. Uh, Iran, Iran also is uh, one of the authoritarian regime. You don't have the freedom of speech. You can't talk uh, openly about your thinking about uh, the governments, the way that things work there. And uh, and especially being a refugee, you are res- your life is restricted to go to so many other things that is available for citizens. So um, it wasn't like uh, great until we returned back, until that... Uh, um, America decided to come to Afghanistan. Uh, and I think that during the time, I have to say that, yes, uh, um, the, the only 20 years of the golden era in whole history after centuries of war and authoritarian regime, it was the last the 20 years that uh, um, we had uh, Republican governments. We had uh, we, we could elect our president. We could elect our um, choosing who could be our representative in the governments. We had the freedom of speech. The, a woman empowerment is happening there. They're comparing with the 2001 when there are less women in the schools and the university. We had uh, millions of the women go to the schools and then uh, we had uh, thousands of women who go to university. We had more than 37% of the population of the parliament were women. We had women in uh, decision making. So a lot of great things is happening during these 20 years that media decided to not cover it mm. and the media i always like well, that the uh, message media are just showing the poverty to show that the conflict and war and insecurity but it wasn't all the story of afghanistan the last 20 years we uh thanks to the obviously taxpayer and thanks to the um america u.s and then uh, the allies uh the lives of millions of people change over time. Mm. Uh, obviously, we had the freedom of speech, but sometimes it's difficult to talk in a society because there are lots of the other cultural norms that is make limited your activities because your neighbor don't like that you say some things that is against of the culture or against of the their beliefs and uh, the way you dress is will be considered in a society. Maybe at that time we didn't have auditorium with you, but. I can say that the society didn't allow you to like to grow or do whatever you want. Right. It's almost like a repressive culture. Yes, a repressive culture, and uh, and it's take years uh, to to change, especially in big cities. We see, and there's uh, before the Taliban took over, we see that changes are happening in big cities, but um, but it was very difficult. I mean, if you wanted to bring the change in a society, it was uh, they, they were not ready for the change. Uh, mm-hmm. They make it very difficult for you to 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 move and uh, that's why i decided to create when i was a big example when i was a first tech female ceo one of the first female tech ceos it was difficult for female engineers to work at the time i'm talking about 2012 2011 and 2013 but then we decided to create more role models society are not ready for one or two or three persons who wanted to bring the change in a society mm-hmm. but what about 100 100 people what about thousands of people can conservative groups fight with thousands of people 
No. I mean, it might be fighting with a few people that try to make your lives hard that you live, but they cannot do it for thousands of hundreds, thousands of people who do similar things. So you, you made it to make normalized things. So that was the reason that we focusing on our education program to create more uh, female engineers or make it uh, technology as an accessible, uh, accessible, acceptable uh, field for women. Mm -hmm. When um, you reach the scale of thousands of people, you have an idea and ideas are very difficult to kill. They're very difficult to silence. Uh, I have to say that we we were be able to to change that. Yeah, yeah. We uh, through the digital cell phone, we had seventeen thousand of the girls come to our program. We had hundreds of them. They started their own startups. And the most successful project that we had it was African Girls Robotic Team that we started in two thousand seventeen. Uh, when first Global contacted me and they asked me to put a team of teenagers to come for robotic competitions, I told them that there is a robotic is very new in Afghanistan. They said that either build a team or find a team. So I decided to build a team all girls because this definitely sent a message for the girls in Afghanistan, also women outside. But this team, you know, in 2017, they couldn't get visa. It's, there is lots of like a, like a drama at the time, but we used the social media to telling our stories. Mm. And it's reached out to the thousands of the congressmen who signed a petition on our behalf. And finally, the girls could come to the United States. They got uh, granted the visa at the last minute and they came and they competed and they got the silver medal. And then they captivated the public eyes with their inspiring message of hope and determination. They changed the view. It was a, because after that, we went to many other stages. We've been many other like competition. I have to say that that was a victory, a vision of hope for a country that for centuries ignored the women's ability in science and many other industries. The Afghan conservative, uh, it was a conservative and very male dominated, but then they changed. They said, oh, the, if you today say that, the, even today you say that the girls can build a drone, they wouldn't say, oh, no, it's not possible. Mm. Uh, when during the pandemic, uh, the, the Afghan girls robotic team, the government reached out to us to build a ventilator when, when there was a shortage <laughs> of the ventilators. They reached that's out to awesome. us and to the uh, to the university, and we are the one who built it. So this is a, just show that how things change in the conservative communities like Kandahar, numerous provinces. I remember when I started my foundation, I wanted to open up my centers there. They didn't like it because they said that internet brings bad values and they didn't want that the women learn about technology. But then after the girls robotic team and promotion and showing that how what the girls can do, they reach out to us to open our centers there. <laughs> and the government, the previous government gave us 10 pieces of hectare of uh, land to build the first STEM schools and innovation centers in Kabul with five other innovation centers across the country because they want that uh, educating the younger generation to be the next generation of the entrepreneur technologists and scientists. So we changed that. So th that's at that point, the IT industry, I believe that it, at the beginning when I started work, they much didn't like my work, but they did it divided at the end. I had a lot of like conservative men who didn't like the women working in engineering and technology, they start to back our program. So it's just uh, take time, but persistent is a uh, one way and keep continue to not be only one persons, you create more role models and more women to, to that society accepted. And it's just, we did it, we show a lot. And I think that we accomplished that. And um, today our center, robotic centers in Kabul is open. So it's like, it's different. That is incredible. You born discriminated against because you're a woman. Fast forward to the COVID pandemic and the government asks you to build them technology. That's some boss relies ass on, shit. Relies on you. That's some yeah. gangster shit. Yep. You know what that means? US slang, that is some gangster fucking shit right there. <laughs> I love that. Um, what fascinating, hearing your story and access to the internet changed your life, it sounds like, right? Yes. Walk us through, like, what social media were you guys using? Uh, is it Twitter, uh, Facebook, both? Um, what, what what social media were you using at the time? We started to using, I mean, at the beginning it was Google and Yahoo Messenger at the time that for chatting, but later on, obviously, Facebook was a way that we were yeah. working, and LinkedIn for the business things we could contact yeah. with the people, and obviously we started Twitter as well. Um, I have to say that we also started to build a, in uh, 2012, we started to building a platform called uh, Women and X. It was a digital media platform mm -hmm. that allow women to publish their thoughts and earn money by publishing their thoughts. We usually mostly encouraging the young girls to write in the blogs and upload the videos and get paid based on the 
social impact of their creative content. And uh, that was uh, increased the number of the, um, our female uh, bloggers across the country. Also, we could extend it to Pakistan. But there was one challenging with this uh, platform, inability to pay in this woman. Mm. Uh, because many of these women didn't have bank account. Mm. Huge. Okay, we'll get there. So th- there's a narrative in your story that technology is very empowering for humanity and very empowering for human rights and can overcome something as powerful as a dictator or an authoritarian regime is that humans historically have an ability to self-coordinate and build tools. And those tools allow us to advance and gain efficiencies and we are able to hyper-specialize. And that's why of all the living things in planet Earth, we're the most dominant one for that general reason is that we're able to build tools and build technology. Uh, And you finding the internet what was it? Was it access to information that changed your life? Was it like connect, when you say connecting to the rest of the world, what does that mean? Like that you got to go on Wikipedia or? Uh, no, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's just uh, connect with information and find different realities exist. Mm. There are different parts of the world that we never knew about that. Right. And uh, information obviously is, is change your lives. And then, also give you to have a critical thinking that some things that you always hear might, might not be true. Right. There are different perspectives that exist and also is increase your knowledge, is increase your skills. And then another thing that was interesting that we communicate with people outside or the community that we know them and they don't discriminate us because we are women. They don't uh, discriminate us that where we are uh, living and what's my social status, if I have money or not have money. And these are all like things that is changing your perspective about the lives. And also, I was a very shy girl. I didn't much talk at the home. I'm still shy, but it's different now. <laughs> uh, but um, I remember when I was chatting with people, it's give you more confidence because you it's, it's just also having access to internet, chat with people, and you know uh, your information uh, increase, your skill is increased, and I start talking at the home as well. And even no one asks my opinion about things. I just give you my opinion on everything because it's just give you confidence, self-confidence, you yeah. know? And you think that you're also worth to give your opinion about things that it's related to your lives. So obviously my brother didn't like it, didn't appreciate it at the beginning because I'm one of seven children. And for those who are living in those uh, society, no, they know that if you have four brothers and three older brothers, how, what does it mean? Uh, but uh, my father, I mean, at the beginning, shocked, but then, he kind of likes my confidence. I think confidence was a key. <laughs> well, so I there's this beautiful thread of perseverance through adversity, becoming the first female CEO in Afghanistan with the robotics team, the visa issues that you guys overcame to compete and eventually take second place. Um, I don't think a well-known story is uh, the internet cafe that you visited for the first time. Uh, there was a bit of perseverance required to actually get your foot in the door there as well, yeah. uh, which was I found to be super interesting because uh, your story for all intents and purposes starts with access to the Internet. But even acquiring that in the onset was difficult. Uh, I believe you had to rely on or, or push your brother to actually get you into to, to the cafe to even start this journey. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it wasn't good for the girl to go to the, in a cafe and at the uh... It was only good for the boys and my cousin to go there and my brothers uh, and um, they didn't welcome much to women. Also, the the, the cafe, the, the person who had that cafe and he didn't like it. I remember the, we went and <laughs> looking at the vitrines and we wants to get inside. Uh, he he didn't allow us at the beginning to get in. So you, you get inside. I mean, I, I think the first thing I probably did accessing the Internet was go on ESPN.com, which is a sports website and check the score of. I don't know, some sports game. What was the first thing you did when you got inside? It was Google. Yeah. What would you Google? Do you remember? Um, I don't remember much, but I think that uh, there was some things related to our schools, and I just wanted to type, and then I see that so many links is open up, and there are many things that you could find in information. It was very easy to get access to the information. I think that was interesting. And I think that the same day we learned about this uh, chat room, that you could talk with people you don't know, and they are a stranger, and... And it's just you introduce yourself and they are not scared because you're a woman and uh, 
they they didn't care basically um they respected and they continued the conversation with you and um i think that these are the things i was uh i was a stranger for someone who didn't have access much and then it's like uh, i i just uh, was cr- my curiosity um wants it more and more than the things that was around of me and i just uh, uh i think that um, uh computer changed my life yeah so. i i think i want to make a point on that like what i don't think people generally understand to many people the internet allowed for the iphone app store to exist for them or it allowed for call of duty and xbox to exist for them or allowed them to order food that can get delivered to them um when in reality the internet is a very empowering tool for that exact point is its global digital communications infrastructure for planet earth and the principles that the internet has there's a freedom in coming and going Um, there's no discrimination in the internet it's a system of users and not admins there is no government on the internet there is no one like an an internet user is an internet user to your point there is no way for me to discriminate against you treat you disequally it is a distributed network of peers that is global and facilitates communication and it's that is why it was so empowering you know for me contrasting your story and government to how empowering the internet was you know there's something dangerous about central planning in my opinion um and this i i don't want to make any opinions on government at large but should a central group define what you can and cannot say should a central group define how much currency of your money is printed should a central group define these things and technology like the internet relieved you specifically of the authoritarian uh sort of rule set that they implied Mm -hmm. on your life and i don't think people generally appreciate how technology can relieve humanity of that and yes apps are really cool and video games are great but creating a digital like public utility for planet earth to have communication with like foundational human freedoms that are embedded in the system changed changed everything changed the world um and that's a theme i think because then eventually you found bitcoin and bitcoin in your life is very different in a similar way to what bitcoin may be to someone on wall street or someone in los angeles so post internet how did you walk into bitcoin or why is money important to you and valuable to solve and need technology in the first place um, yeah, my journey to Bitcoin is, um, is back in 2013. Uh, as I mentioned, we had this platform um, which allow uh, women to publish their thoughts and get paid. And we had, you know, hundreds and thousands of users and we have to ping our influencer. And uh, many of these women didn't have bank account. At that time, I was realized that obviously I was lucky because my father allowed me to have a bank account. I had a business. But it's not the case for millions of the people, especially women. Why couldn't they get a bank account? Just like bank would say, no, sorry, you're a woman, turn around. No, no, no. It's a eighty-five uh, percent of the population in Afghanistan they don't trust the bank. Why not? Because bank was corrupted, mm. and then um, when you are living in a conflict zone, um, your government could be changed over time. And the first thing that is happening is that your account will be freeze, and all your asset will take, and the government will watch how much your money you have. And uh, people are more trusted Hawala, which it was a uh, eighth century of the traditional way of the transferring money in the Muslim communities. And people trust them more than the bank. So they prefer Hawala, which was very male dominated. I mean, you didn't find any one woman in the Hawala really? uh, industries. And then, and the other reason is that uh, many of the people didn't had ID. So when you go to the bank, this requires you a lot of documentation. ID was one key uh, that you, you needed to provide. And women, usually, some of them didn't have an ID. So that was another issue. Another one is that for women was also education about uh, saving, uh, budgeting, and, and you know, law and all of these things. It's uh, just... Uh, 
uh, some things that they didn't learn and they didn't understand it. So that was another education was and financial literacy was another issues that they have. And they're not they're on, there wasn't there wasn't much uh, a bank uh, in the rural area and uh, uh, that uh, people could have access. And you know, another thing is uh, the most important things in this. So like uh, we, we know that 1.7 billion of people don't ha- they don't have bank account for many reasons. Mm. But the issue with uh, South Asia, which is mostly uh, women don't have bank account. I think the 56% compared to the 46, 44 uh, of the male. If I say the correct uh, status, mm-hmm. but it's just uh, it's mostly also because of the social norms. Uh, men's are trying to control in the finance of the women, and it's uh, difficult for women to go and open a bank account and giving their pictures, giving their like all the details with their numbers, phone number, home address. It's something that the men don't like that their women women share other other places. So that's uh, also is uh, affected on uh, cultural norms. It's affected the women to not have a bank account. What was the alternative s- system? W- what was the name of it? Ha- Hawale. Hawale. When was that created? Did you say the 8th century? It's from 8th century's uh, ways of the transferring the money with the Muslim community. It's a very Asian uh, way of transferring money in traditional ways, which is still is active in Muslims, in some of the Muslim communities. And Afghanistan still is very active. Operating on a system created in, I'm not a time guy, but the the eighth century i think it's the eighth century if i did not say it's an asian way maybe i i i have to check it double check it but it's a very old uh, or asian way of the transferring the money that's a long time ago i think it's a long time ago <laughs> that's a long time ago it's a long time and they, it's based on the honor and it's a uh, is that mostly is a family things that they um, um it's mostly family things, and they uh, inherited to another family, another generation, and is based on the trust and honor of the people. So you give, uh, like for example, you go to one of the whole people here, and then uh, you give the money, and they give you a code, and then you give the uh, the code to someone else, to someone who you want uh, to receive the money, and then they take it to the Hawala people that they have in their cities, and that's why. The, the, they give the money. I mean, I, that's why I think yeah. that like, Bitcoin is kind of like similar to Hawale as a, as a 21st century's ways of that, as a technology ways. Uh, and instead, the human we use computer uh, to sending the, yeah. the, the uh, and we have uh, the wallet address basically to sending the money. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that uh, that was a uh, Hawale. It's, uh, it's a very old. Uh, yeah ways of sending money well i'm trying to put myself and imagine myself in this yeah drink some water i'll drink some with you i'm trying to imagine myself in the situation you're describing where you know like all of my friends and all the women that i know in chicago you know they have robin hood app and venmo and you can buy stocks and you have a savings account and a checking account and a credit card and a debit card and there's a lot of financial access there if they didn't have any i'm trying to understand how was there a concept of saving money or like having money under the mattress or if you needed to make a transaction would you like ask your dad like hey i need to pay somebody do you mind sending this money for me because i can't or like what was that environment like Uh, well you had a bank account but generally speaking what like it would this Hawala solution or what was that? No, Hawala solution also was mostly for men. I mean, it's very male dominated uh, in this way. And then mm. um, uh, usually the, the the problem, yes. I mean, you have to you how you are rely on your father, brothers, and husband. So you don't son. have relationship with like money pretty much at all. Not much. Uh, <laughs> then uh, obviously, women usually if they have money, they buy gold as a way of the saving and as a why way of the why is that investment. that's super interesting why uh, if you have money you prefer it's just like the habits they like gold because they know the price of the gold over time maybe increase so that was one of the way that the women and uh, like if they don't have a business to stay at the mm-hmm. home uh, uh the purchases the gold and it's very important for them and then um another thing is obviously you just mentioned yeah they, they 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 if they have a little bit saving they put it on the on their mattress and usually cash was very important for them uh, to keep it, uh, but uh, in general, if they have money and um, it's a gold, it's something that they prefer to purchase it. 
And um, yeah, I mean, it's a div- div- difficult, especially in a rural area. Women don't have much access to money, basically. The right. men bring the money and they provide everything. And a uh, woman can give the list of the things that they needed and men purchase for them. So that's the usual is happen. But middle class family, maybe they have buying gold for themselves. Mm. And, uh, you know, the um, uh, low income family, they only think about how they can have food for the today for lunch or dinner. So there's all the things that they more care. But usually women were more rely on the men in the family and the family and the women who don't have male and they have to start like a traditional businesses. They also rely on the cash still if to get to the access to the market to selling their stuff. If they don't have a male, they have to go there and selling and it's, it's about the cash to receive it. Yeah. Um, but the, I mean, the recent years before Taliban took over, things get changed. The educated one, they started to have their bank account, they start their businesses, or the people who work for the government, they they require to have a bank account. The people who work for the international organization, they require to have a bank account. But uh, not the majority of people. 85% um, didn't trust the bank. And uh, I, I have to say that the last 20 years, obviously, with the help of the international community, the banking sector in Afghanistan had a lot of growth and uh, we had a uh, central bank that uh, created the uh, regularity and policies for the um, local banks and uh, that is attracted investment, the, the checking everything. But um, the problem was that we didn't have enough the financial services in the rural area and uh, there is lots of like uh, not available credit and then uh, and then the other issues they still uh, because of the paperwork uh, a family mm-hmm. don't like that the women who have a bank account to have the you know in conservative society some conservative society men don't like that the other men have their wives pictures yeah. or the cell phone numbers or home audit because lots of things that the, pa- uh, the paperwork is required the banks uh, yeah. uh, which they don't like it and then corruption the uh, the bank uh, couldn't create the trust between people and um, so that was another issue is the corruption um, uh, make people to to not trust the bank yeah i mean freezing freezing assets and confiscating assets is again something that i don't think is generally known is that there are billions of people that have their money in a bank and then one day the bank wakes up and says that's not yours that's mine you're poor Exactly. And for everyone that I grew up with, I need you to understand that. Is if Chase Bank took all your savings and said, "Jokes on you. You're poor. Your life sucks and there's nothing you could do about it." And if that was a reality that would happen, I wouldn't put my money in a bank either. Why would I do that? That is fucking insane. Yes, and it's happened, you know, when Taliban took over the country, uh, banking system collapsed. And those who had money in the bank, they, overnight they get uh, their bank uh, account was freezed, especially those who work for the U.S. government or especially for the previous government of Afghanistan. Their bank is freezed. No one can have access, including my parents. I try so like hard to get my parents to change their monies in the bank to get buying the Bitcoin and my parents, they always watching TV. So they read the news and they didn't trust and says, no, we prefer the cash. And um, so they, many of the people who were evacuated at the time, they, overnight they became bankrupt. Everything that they had was freezed. Their asset was uh, also freezed by the new regime and they had to leave the country only with one pack, uh, ba- like a backpack. And uh, there was nothing that they could take it unless if they had jewelry. And in some cases, when you do evacuation, you have to go to the ru- uh, like, uh, roads, which if you have a jewelry, everything they will uh, like- uh, Confiscate uh, it? Yeah, get mm. uh, by other people who are trying to help you. So. Uh, I know a lot of my friends that they had uh, huge bills and they, I remember one of the businessmen that I work, I used to work with him, he had factories, they had uh, farms and whenever I talk about cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, he wasn't much, he says I'm traditional yeah. person using the traditional business for us, t- t- we have to see in uh, either cash or we have to see that we buying houses and investing on real estate on farms, he had to leave overnight. And he left it, and then his family left it. Right now, he doesn't have access to any of his wealth. No, his factories, no, his farm, no, gone. the cash, everything is gone. And he first thing that he told me when I called him that if how if he's safe or 
he just told me that he really did a big mistake that he didn't listen to me to, to invest it on something that is not going to be controlled by any governments or like authorities that uh, take it from you so you know if you're living in a conflict zone or authoritarian regime if you say something that they don't like it and um and if your government is changed because of your uh, like relationship with the previous governments, the next day you are poor. You don't have anything. And the entire things that you build on that, or your wealth, your lives, everything will take from you. And um, it's difficult, you know. It's We're talking about millions of the people. And today, 54% of the population of the world, we're talking about 54% of the population of the world, that living either under auditorium regime or conflict zone, or in a high inflation uh, place. So I think that uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin uh, is a beacon of hope for us, is, a, is an alternative uh, means of having access to the finance. It's a give us a feeling of uh, security and stability that if I say something uh, or, or if I wanted to leave the country uh, or or if there is a uncertainty within economics, my wealth, my asset will not take over, because most of the autonomous regime and uh, uh, like those uh, governments, they trying to control your finance because then they can control you, and you cannot really talk much about the policies that gonna affect in your life, the corruption that they are involved with, and uh, you basically have no uh, no say on anything uh, and you have to accept it whatever they they giving you and uh, you know um, it's a difficult life under the I don't regime and I had that life and I can feel it and uh, yeah well, there's a story of a uh, your friend or perhaps your co-worker um, describing her journey going from Afghanistan to I believe Germany yes and along the way uh, she leaves with money. She's able to leave with, with money. And along the way, for whatever rhyme or reason, everything that she owns gets confiscated from her. She lands in Germany with quite literally zero dollars. But she had Bitcoin. Um, and she, I believe she liquidated $2,500 worth of that Bitcoin yes. and was able to restart her, her life. life. Exactly. And something that I think is interesting in my personal life is that I refer to Bitcoin as freedom money and money in the bank uh, does not make you free. It can be confiscated. It can be controlled. It can be taken away from you. And I think that in that story is a microcosm of the power of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is freedom money. Well, I was going to make the point, um, like even taking a step back from that. Yeah, that's of course true. And it's a phenomenal point. Um, but uh, money itself uh, falls within the right of property, is property rights. And I don't think people generally understand the implications of that, what that means. When people think property, at least in America, like property is my home or property is my car. Um, first of all, property rights is, is the human right to own things, is that you're allowed to own and trade things on your own merit. And that nobody can come and just confiscate your, pro like put a gun to your head and take your property from you. Is that in the United States of America, it is illegal for someone to come walk in my house with a rifle and make it their house. That's illegal. That's violating my property rights. Now, what's very interesting is that somehow as humanity has evolved, the knowledge and understanding that money is property uh, is very lost on society today. And it can be taken from you in many different ways. One is that you should not be allowed to just take someone's money and confiscate the money that they have in an account. That'd be the equivalent of walking into my house with a gun and saying, this is now my house. That's a violation of property rights. You mentioned inflation. Inflation is a violation of property rights. When your government prints more money, it makes your property worth less. And so it would be the equivalent of if the government just made my house worthless. It's a, it's, a, it's a vehicle to rob someone and commit crime against their ability to own property. Is if you devalue the property that I have, then I own nothing. So what's the difference between you walking into my house with a, a gun and taking it from me or you just making it worth zero? It's the same thing. You've stolen from me. And so it's a huge 
uh, point that I don't think people understand when we talk about the internet, we're talking about freedom of speech, the ability to opine, to come, to go, and to discover and to converse and exchange information freely. It is a foundational human right that is required for society to function and for humans to flourish. Property rights is another, and people don't necessarily bucket money into property rights. And so when you hear stories like that and when you talk about Bitcoin, for me, what the internet is for communication, Bitcoin is for money. Bitcoin gives all 8 billion people property rights. No, the fact that nobody can inflate it and nobody can confiscate it allows all of us to freely have property rights despite the intent of any government or any other person. And for freedom of speech, we've gotten used to that in the internet. And we have Twitter and you were able to change a lot of lives through social media. For Bitcoin, we're just starting. And hearing stories like yours for me gives me hope and inspires me that the work that we're all doing on Bitcoin is giving humanity property rights in the same way that the internet gave humanity freedom of speech, but through money, which is a nuanced point. I don't think people necessarily think my property is money, um, but it is, and it's true. And it's actually the most effective way for a government to steal from you and for a government to control you is to make sure that you can't have a bank account or to make sure that they can steal from your wealth by just printing more dollars or more currency. So I think that that's like a massive point that isn't realized in the West, but is realized when I've gotten to know you and understanding that half the world doesn't have property rights. Yeah, and then I think that human rights activists um, uh, constantly promoting the freedom, justice, and uh, equality. Uh, in a dangerous environment where the author authorities are constantly checking what they are doing. And, uh, and I think that Bitcoin gives them alternative financial uh, means to protect their entity and communications. Many of the human rights activists trying to helping each other and, uh, and uh, sending money to, to the people um, in a country that they promote uh, freedom and and. To, to 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 way to protect yourself that the government because the government is usually check your bank account and they 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 don't allow uh, the money to come from outside if especially is uh, trying to uh, promote the democracies and this organization and these people I think that Bitcoin is just a safeguard of the human rights. You're right, and it it gets me fired up. I'm getting worked <laughs> up over here because I live in the United States of America. Supposedly the most democratic, strongest country in the world. My government robs from me all the time. How? That's crazy, Jack. You have a house. You have a car. How? Over 25% of the U.S. dollars that exist right now were printed in the last few years. That's why my dollars don't get me as many groceries or don't get me as nice of a car or don't get me as cool of a house. Housing prices are up. Groceries are up. Electricity is up. Gas is up. Everything, energy is up. My dollars are now worth less. The U.S. government has stolen from me because I stored my wealth in that and they've devalued my property. So even in the most elite, democratic, Wall Street country of the world, governments and central banks violate a foundational human right, which is property rights. And so even if you live in Los Angeles and you're listening to this, you cannot escape the reality that money is property and governments steal from your property actively without your consent. That's the, that's the biggest part is the U.S. government didn't say, hey, Jack, you know, we got an issue. You mind if we devalue your property and allow me to think about it and say, oh, yo, you know what? Sure, I'll, I'm willing to take that hit. They just do it anyway. Um, and they do it for and it just it just bothers me. Uh, anyway, um, oh, were you going to say something? I just uh, want to mention when the banking system collapsed in Afghanistan and the uh, Taliban took over, uh, it was uh, very hard when the U.S. military also left the country, it was very hard to send uh, money to Afghanistan. And the banking was run out of the cash. The Western Union didn't work well. MoneyGram didn't work. They all ran out of the cash. And because of the bad monetary policy, uh, one third of the population suffered from food insecurity. And 50 to 70 percent of the people had unstable housing. And then during that challenging time, 
cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and stable coins were the only ways that saved the lives. You could send the money easily to, I mean, aid organization and families had really challenging to send money to Afghanistan, but then cryptocurrency saved so many of the lives during time because with push of a button, you could send the money to uh, someone who had an account there and they could make it uh, cash and they could pay for, for the, the buying the food, paying the rents. And also, I know that some organization, as I mentioned to you, is that for the evacuation uh, during yep. that time. So um, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is promote stability in um, economics, uh, unstabilities, countries that racket by bad governance. And uh, yeah, I think it's promote stability in some cases. And uh, I mean, uh, during the time that I was used uh, cash to send the money just imagine if you only have using cash and you don't have a credit card and debit card because usually you're living in a society that people only know is cash uh, you have to taking the cash and uh, going to the city is difficult because there is a risk of kidnapping and thief you have a lot of cash and can send the money and then if you send it to room uh, uh, remote places there is no enough transparency if the people receive the cash and most of these big organizations that they send monies in uh, remote uh, with big like uh, boxes. They have to send guard and everything so to, to make security. And there is no any transparency if the beneficiary will receive it. So I think that uh, when we start to use the Bitcoin, it's uh, Bitcoin is really help us to bypass the physical and social barriers to paying this woman. And uh, yeah, it's a beacon of hope, Bitcoin, and uh, a safeguard of the human right. It's uh, that's absolutely right. That's beautifully said. Um, and it, it provides all of us property rights. I know, I only know this because it's my currency off the top of my head. In uh, 1950, a house in the U.S. was 2,500 U.S. dollars. Now, if I were to take, and that was around uh, the time where my dad was born. So let's say my dad had $2,500 and he just put it under his mattress and was like, okay, this is going to get me a house at some point. I'll save it. Uh, now, 2,500, a house an average house in America is $450,000. $2,500 nowadays wouldn't even maybe get you a bicycle. <laughs> yeah. And that is theft. That is a violation of property rights, of the human right to own property. And the central bank, the Federal Reserve, stole that from those holding the dollar. That is, that is violating our freedoms. People don't understand that. Now, for you and for others that we've met and those in the world, imagine that overnight where you go through hyperinflation and mismanagement in emerging markets over the world or through authoritarian regimes, and you've lost the ability to buy things overnight is the most ridiculous, and I just want to make sure this point is so clear because there are people like Dave Portnoy uh, of Barstool that don't necessarily understand that Bitcoin could be a hopeful tool to reinstill a human freedom like property rights for those that are living within a dictator that are discriminated because they're a woman, that don't have access to information, that don't have access to hold property and hold money and transact in a marketplace, which is, these are fundamental human rights. And without Bitcoin, um, you didn't have that. Now you have that. And so shout out to Dave Portnoy. Um, Hopefully, this is educational, my friend, because even in the United States, your property rights are getting violated every single time the U.S. prints another dollar. Um, and then hearing your story, um, it's even more so. And I really wish the world didn't look at Bitcoin as a portfolio asset, as something that goes up and down like Apple stock, but as a technology like the Internet that can help reinstill human rights through technological innovation as opposed to force and violence and guns and war, right? Like I know the U.S. was very impactful in your life, um, but that took war and that took murder and that took violence. And Bitcoin is the most peaceful revolution of instilling property rights and human rights that we've ever seen probably. Um, so it's incredible. So anyways, uh, tell us more about your Bitcoin story. You are like as educated and sophisticated and profound in Bitcoin's story and journey um, as I've heard. Um, but I didn't give you an opportunity to start from the beginning. Why Bitcoin? How'd you hear about it? And why did you elect to start using it? Sure. I mean, 
as I mentioned, this platform that we had and we have to pay these women and we had a lot of difficulties to pay the women because taking cash, taking to, to the office or sending uh, across the different provinces was very difficult. We, the middleman, it was expensive. It was, um, uh, it was not transparent that if the, my female user was receiving the money. And then we heard that uh, we decided to use mobile money, which was very uh, successful projects in, in Kenya. And M-Pesa was uh, mm -hmm. at that time active in big cities, but it was also expensive because of the, the fee exchanges uh, for that. But also it wasn't really proper work. So then we decided, uh, again, if you receive the money, you have to give to your brothers to get the cash for you. This is just, again, the same things. And then uh, we decided to use PayPal. PayPal didn't work in Afghanistan and Pakistan at the time. And then we were really had the challenging what to find. We heard about Bitcoin in 2013. My uh, business partner, Francesco, who was living in New York, he heard about Bitcoin. He sent an article about that. And I said, like, you know, it's interesting. I was a little bit skeptical at the beginning. I said, like, this is uh, people here believe on cash. It's something that they can, I, they can feel, feel hold it. on to. Mm, yeah. And then he said, that just uh, take a look at that. Is it, is it interesting? And then I was just reading because there was no idea or all options. So like, okay, let's let's working with Bitcoin and then um, we deploy a payment system based on Bitcoin and then it was very interesting because with push of a button the Bitcoin was uh, magically appear in the wallets of the women digital wallets of the women and the women suddenly received your money whether they did many middlemen whether to wait a couple of days to receive their money and that was dear money and no one knows if they have received money or not and then uh, no one could take it from them they didn't need it to go to the bank to stay for a long uh, time in the lines to receive their money and everybody's if they because the small city they know that you went to the bank someone see that you have the cash but you have your own money and you you owner of your own money that was uh, interesting when we see that the women are are get excited that they have uh, this bank and my sister actually was, uh, I think, the first person who started to do be exchanger. It's like uh, how all the people who exchanged rates and mm -hmm. uh, buying bitcoins and selling and with the different prices at the time. And then we started talking with the shops, especially the shops of the clothes, if the people accept the bitcoin of the girls, so we can give them a cash. In this way, we, we wanted to promote bitcoin. But obviously, uh, after a while, because of inflation with bitcoin, I have to say the truth that. Um, I, I was also accused of being fraud and uh, scam because people didn't understand. I'm talking about 2013. Because the price went down, you're saying? Before price goes down, uh, Bitcoin was something new and we promote that and uh, lots of the owners started using the Bitcoin. But uh, people were skeptical, oh, especially the male uh, IT industries. They were not trusted and they said that this is a scam. This is like, you know, we don't know if this is a really existed and then... Um, but then when the inflation is happening and the price uh, goes down, uh, obviously I lost two thirds of my business, but uh, I have to buy again the, the differences of the, the Bitcoin uh, that we're giving uh, to the women who didn't sold it uh, yet. But uh, then I found out that there is always, as I mentioned, if you we start something, society is not ready for it. And I was really believed in Bitcoin because I thought that this is the first thing that is like revol revolutionary. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the money of the people. It's not owned by any like companies or governments. And if you really believe on that, you can, no one can take it from you. So I was thinking about that. This is interesting. Let's, uh, it's like digital gold. And I thought that this is something if women uh, cannot go to the whole they can start at this digital havala and like you know it's something that the women can work at the home and they can do the trade and they can do like uh even saving the monies and no one can take money from them so i was really on keen on that but i thought that education is the key for mass adoption so you have to provide education for people to know what is this because people if they don't understand it they don't want to use it mm -hmm. because they don't understand how it's work. So that's why we provide education uh, for the girls. We provide financial literacy as in general because they have to learn how to manage from money from level of home to level of entrepreneurship. But then they learn about bitcoins and how they can download it and uh, digital wallets, how they can save or how they can um, uh, use uh, Bitcoin as a, as a way of the transfer of the money because it's a cheaper, faster and they could... Uh, to, to, to their loved ones easily send and receive money and uh, with a little amount of the, the fees compared to the wallet and, and the bank. Yeah. 
and uh, that was the things and we did uh, decided and i have to say that after years i mean before the taliban took over the 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 market especially how the market is flourished with cryptocurrencies and we had uh, especially the younger generation start using cryptocurrency young uh people and uh, we had big markets of the cryptocurrency in kabul mazar and jalalabad during the um, uh, like collapse of the banking system this market were active until that taliban decided to shut down the market because first they wanted to know have uh, control on the finance of the people obviously they want to know that uh, who receive money who doesn't receive money and uh, especially have a uh, bond on the organization send the money and as a crypto and they wanted to to see to whom they are sending but also because there was uh, a scam uh, some people using um, exchanger for trading and uh, scam people and because there was not um, yeah. much information on ever creating a variance some people scammed uh, and that was the reason that I said, okay, education is important for mass adoption of Bitcoin, but creating a variance also is important. We have, we, we have a say in, when I go to trend in New York, they says, if you say something, if you see some things, say some things. <laughs> I think it's the same for the Bitcoiner. When they're working, um, we, d if we know that someone is a scam and we know that this person is not doing right, we have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. We should not let, let it, uh, to, they can uh, walk away because those people, there are a few, but they are damaging the reputation of the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Yep. And um, and that's uh, and other things. I think that uh, we need to focus on the education. And uh, if people knows about these tools, they wanted to use it. During the, the time that uh, banking system was collapsed, even my uncle, like 60, more than 60 years old, not could read and write, but they know that how to download the uh, blue <laughs> wallet and ask That's them awesome. to send them my money. And then they go to the market to make it cash. They just needed to know how to like, be, like just simple button that they learn. And they learn fast, basically, uh, to receive money and make it cash. It's just, I think that people don't know many of them about these tools. And if they just heard it, so if they hear bad news, so they don't, they are skeptical. But if you provide education, that's the key and we need to put this education in the schools and uh, for the younger generation because bitcoin is the future anyway we have to work it for that so that's yeah. why you're i education is so important i deeply respect and cheer you on really to be honest with you um it's such a moral humble mission that you have going like you're not trying to create this new crazy big thing or it's just like teaching people what's hopefully best for them. You know, it's also interesting. We just had a guy, Paul Saladino. Do you, have you heard of Paul? He like eats a lot of steak or I'll send you his stuff. He's great. Um, he made this comment that it's there when you need it, which is cool, I think, is that also is that Bitcoin, like it doesn't impose itself on anybody um, like your uncle. Like if you are in the need to own property that can't be inflated or can't be confiscated or whatever the circumstances it is, it's there when you need it. And I think that's how I think about Bitcoin's adoption. So when I look at the chart over time, it's just more and more and more and more people have gotten educated and needed it. And I think that just stuff just takes time. What I, so hearing your story, I'm curious. So I got into Bitcoin similar time as you. I got in Bitcoin in 2013. My dad got in late 2012, I believe, and then got me in in 2013. Uh, and when I got into Bitcoin was right when the price went from $200 all the way down to, I think it was, oh no, $1,200 to $200, right? Am I, so this was the 2013 to 2015 bear market where Bitcoin was at $1,200 on Mt. Gox was an exchange once upon a time. And it went all the way down from 1200 to 200 And hearing your story, and people already think that you're scamming them and they don't understand how this thing works. Combine that with the price dropping. Um, what was that like? And how did you say, no, no, this thing is legit and it's going to go back up? Did you believe that? Oh, and like, I mean, today volatility is tough for people. How did you handle that? I mean, it was difficult. I said that uh, I lost a lot of money because I want to keep my reputation. And, and, and my sister, actually, she paying for the woman's uh, the difference yeah. of the money. Oh, but you made everyone whole on the difference. 
uh, those who keep their bitcoins we give wow. the difference and wow. the, some of people wants to keep their bitcoin because they believe that it might goes up but i always believe that it goes up and i you know everything's when you started at the beginning it might have some challenges but i believed on that and over a time it's bitcoin is proof that over a time it goes much uh, like uh, like uh, get the price gets uh, more and then um obviously in the short time it has uh, some inflation and uh but it's always good that uh, w I, as I told uh, like my students as well, to not put everything you have, just put the money that you donated, but it's just an investment. It's like gold. Also gold uh, goes up and down. Yep. So uh, when I purchase gold uh, as part of jewelry, in some cases when I want to sold, there is some, uh, like uh, you will lose some value. Or in some cases and sometimes, you actually gain, uh, but yep. obviously gold, uh, the the price is not very high or like losing <laughs> or gaining a lot or losing a lot. But it's not as volatile. Not not yeah. volatile, but uh, but I think that the Bitcoin is different. Allah, um, my sister, when he, she kept some of this Bitcoin in 2013, she she bought it. She came to the U.S. and then she accepted at the Cornell University, but she didn't have full scholarship. Cornell University was expensive. And then at that time, I think that the Bitcoin goes to 2,500 mm -hmm. and she sold it out all of her Bitcoins to most of the Bitcoins that she had it to, to go and paying for her university. And then obviously she sold it, but I think that a week or two weeks after that, it goes to 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that speaking of inflation and such, that's an interesting is that she had a certain amount of bitcoins that she got at 200, but let's say she had 100 bitcoins, and those 100 bitcoins couldn't have gotten her Cornell University. But yes. over time, if you hold bitcoin over time, your life gets cheaper because yes. everything, like over time, when I got into bitcoin, a house was 100,000 bitcoin, and then a few years later, it was 10,000 bitcoin, and then a few years later, it was 1,000 bitcoin. And nowadays, someone's dream home is 100 bitcoin, and I bet in a few more years, maybe it'll be 10 bitcoin. That's a really cool story that uh, your sister got a Cornell University education because of holding in Bitcoin. Yes. And then another thing is that uh, obviously for us, uh, like when we provide education for in developing countries for, for women to learn about financial literacy, Bitcoin is not only for um, uh, saving for future, uh, but it's mostly for the exchange. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy to send money to the home or from border and it's it's fast it's cheaper and uh, it doesn't need a lot of documentation basically that uh, required and uh, business women's uh, a small and medium business women can easily use that as a, as a way to selling their products and receiving the money and I think that's uh, something that um, um, it's worth to think about that uh, yes for the people here uh, they m maybe they're saving that in the, with the hope that the future the price goes up and become rich but i think that for millions of the people is uh, is a way of exchanging of money of transferring money fast because you still use bitcoin today with your digital citizens foundation that it's a program that educates and has graduated i believe thousands uh, of of women at this point which is incredible but when the taliban took over again the education system regressed uh, in Afghanistan to a point where I believe uh, going to school for women after the age of 15 is no longer legal. Yes, it is it's no legal. longer legal. And I believe that the your foundation still continues to educate women past the age of 15 and the way in which you exchange value, read another way, pay those teachers is, is through Bitcoin, right? Yes. When we're receiving the donations, Bitcoin, we're paying our teachers... Uh, uh, in that way, so they can keep continue underground education for the girls at, uh, above of 15 and or from 7th grade to 12th grade, so they can continue their education in the underground uh, classes. For anyone that doesn't believe that this talk, like technology has an altruistic component, I simply refer them to your story. I think it's one of the coolest medium of, of exchanges, one of the coolest ways Bitcoin is exchanged, period, that I've ever heard of, is that it's being used right now as a medium of exchange to pay teachers to continue to educate women underground illegally and graduating and continuing to provide a path of education for those people that is simply excuse my french fucking amazing <laughs> yeah and i mean i hearing you also i was gonna make the point 
I don't think people understand technological advancement, how much better it is. And people don't necessarily look at Bitcoin as a technology yet, in my opinion. Um, what do I mean by that? How much better is the car than a horse or walking? You know, is the is a car better than a horse? No, it's not only better. It's a thousand times better. Okay. How much better is a plane than a kayak? If I need to go to Europe, I could fly United or I could take a kayak. How much better is flying a Boeing? A thousand times better. <laughs> if I need to send a message to someone in Australia, uh, I could send a pigeon. I could ride a horse carriage and deliver it by hand, or I could send them a text. How much better is a text? A thousand times better. So Bitcoin is monetary technology. And so when people are like, is it faster? Uh, is it more scarce? Uh, is it cheaper? No, no, no. It's not only cheaper, faster, better. It's a thousand times better. And I don't think people generally understand that we're living through a technology advancement and like what that means. It's, it's an order of magnitude, cheaper, faster, more accessible, more private, uh, scarcer. So it, it'll go up. How, how much more has Bitcoin gone up against the dollar than gold? A thousand times more, right? <laughs> yes. So I just, it, I, I think it's a great point that you're making and you're way ahead of the curve than the rest of the populace on why this technology is so cool and so valuable, which brings me to one of my last questions is, do you, when I have gotten to know you, and I've gotten to hang out with Alex and the Human Rights Foundation and hear these stories that exceed my life in Chicago and America. I realized that the rest of the world is adopting Bitcoin way faster and way more knowledgeable than me and my peers. Yes, the U.S. is wealthier and there's a lot more wealth concentrated in the United States. So maybe more people buy Bitcoin and there are exchanges there. But understanding the technology, understanding its merits, understanding it's about education, understanding volatility is no big deal. And don't get scared and stick in it because it's going to go up in the long run. All of those things. Do you think that's because why do you think that? First of all, do you believe that that's true? Is that like there's a lot of other places outside of Europe and UK and the US which you think would be the financial hub to innovate in money but I think that you're the true innovator with Bitcoin in Bitcoin you actually were able to adopt to solve real life problems and you actually understand it better than people on Wall Street and is that because gold was a part of your culture because it wasn't a part of my culture growing up do you think it's because of the problems that Bitcoin presented to solve do you believe that the other parts of the world outside of the most developed and the most West do have a more sophisticated understanding of this technology? How, like, what do you think about all that? I think that uh, one issue is that people who grow up with opportunity and have a stable coin and stable, like US has a dollar, Europe has a euro, and you have a democratic society, so you have more secure. And that's very difficult for these people who uh, grew up and take granted uh, the freedom of speech and democracy and is able to think about that other half of the population living in a darkness. For us, is about how we can find a way to have a li bit, little bit better life and have uh, using different uh, technology advancement for our advantage to get like secure our wealth, our asset. Uh, against of the authoritarian regime or inflations. So uh, financial freedom is very important for us because it's empowering individuals. It's also reduced the poverty and giving you a stable and secure minds that your wealth is not going to take take away. And when I heard, I mean, I, as, as I said, I was at the beginning skeptical about Bitcoin because I thought, okay, well, this is not like cash because I was grew up with cash. Yeah. Mm, what and the I, hell is this? But yeah. yeah, but I also know uh, gold. Mm -hmm. I know the value of the gold because my mom, wherever we ha she had money, saving money and buying the gold that in the hope that in the future will be a little bit increased and she can a little bit make money. But, uh, and when I was looking at the Bitcoin and the prices, but I thought this is 
this is simple like it's just look like a, a virtual like kind of virtual wallet system but also it's like a digital gold mm. but the cool thing is about that we could keep it you know uh, and no one can take it and no one can tiff it unless that you forgot your password you can keep it and you can travel everywhere and you're not worried that someone's gonna take it from you and then basically over a time you make more money <laughs> than you do it with the gold and then as well, as I mentioned, that most uh, uh, important things for, for the people in our community is just sending the money, transferring the money fast, cheaper, without the in, like middleman who's going to take it from you and uh, make it more expensive. Or the government watch where did you send the money. And if you say something, like uh, they freezing your account and, uh, and taking your wealth. So I think that's for us... Uh, Bitcoin is safeguard of the human rights and is an alternative uh, means of the fun accessing to financial um, system. You're a hero. You're a hero. I know you said Bitcoin gives you hope. Genuinely, you have given me hope, honestly. I've been working on Bitcoin for 10 years, and I'm not going to lie. Sometimes it does get hard. Sometimes I do question why I'm doing this. Sometimes I do think about what would life be if I wasn't, and Hearing your stories so inspirational and uh, knowing what Bitcoin means to you and then how you've been able to take that and further educate and change so many lives, I really hope people take the time uh, and listen to this podcast and hear your story. You're a legend. You're a boss. Thank you. You're a hero, seriously. Um, and uh, it is inspiring to be your friend and and to uh, w watch you you do what you do. It's really incredible. I'm a little speechless. Um, thank you so much yeah. for coming on. Anything else? Sure. I heard. Uh, <laughs> I heard. In a, I, I heard. Hope. Described to me, today, uh, at one of the talks, um, as an idea. And this idea just simply represents a better future. Hope is an idea that represents a better future. I think Bitcoin represents hope. I think education represents hope. And I think you, to millions of women, to millions of men, to millions of people across the world, I believe you represent hope. I do. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate that. Thank you. Let's fucking go.